Welcome um, to, uh, to our talk, Where's Your Money Going? The Beginner's Guide to Monitoring, uh, Measuring Kubernetes Costs. My name is Mark Poco. I'm a senior software engineer at Grafana Labs. And with I'm, me is... I'm, I'm Juan Co, also at Grafana Labs, working both with work, work at the platform team. Yes. Um, so before we start, let's do a little bit of a story, right? Imagine a scenario, you get your cloud bill, uh, your Kubernetes cost doubles month over month, and uh, you're trying to figure out where did your, where, where did it come from? So you start with your bill and you look at it, and no matter what you do, it doesn't really help you figure out where that cost is coming from. So the next thing you do, you go to your cost explorer and see what other dimensions are available for you, and really don't come up with much. And in this case, we're showing, um, uh, what's it called, the incidence types. You might be able to see where that cost is coming from, but nothing about the cluster or the workload. So you turn to your favorite da uh, <laughs> data visualization tool and you look at things like CPU usage and memory utilization. Look at this over time and still nothing is really standing out to you on what is driving our costs. And this leaves you sad. So, <laughs> show of hands, how many people have had this happen before? All right, that's, yeah, everybody. Um, <laughs> yeah. How many people are running kube state metrics in your Kubernetes cluster? All right, so the good news is for those that are doing this, you're gonna be able to walk away today with some prompt call queries that you could run and be able to visualize this. And those that don't, hopefully this is a good incentive to maybe look into kube state metrics. So what can you expect today? First thing we're gonna do is that there's a, we're gonna to try to show a couple approaches that we use at Grafana Labs to help um, bridge the disconnect between your billing statement and the metrics that you're already collecting in your Kubernetes cluster. After that, we're gonna step through a couple of PromQL examples to help measure, um, in this particular case, we're gonna show CPU because that's usually the most costly. Um, and then finally, we're gonna share a couple of lessons learned, both in terms of setting this up and measuring it, and also, uh, how we helped improve that cost. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Wanho. So, um, yeah, to, to start digging in into this, uh, we need to understand uh, the nature of our, our spendings. This is a really very simple formula, as you can see. Spending the amount of money that you pay for your resources on a particular period of time, usage being the amount of units, the number of units of such resources, and the rate is how much you are being charged for for each of these units. This is important to, 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 group, to, get, to group separate, actually, to be able to focus on the force that you put on each part of these factors. Like, in usage, we, we can see the things like, for example, amount of CPU cores, amount of memory, traffic, and such. And in this rate are dollars per each unit of these, uh, of these resources from the cloud providers. And this uh, then drives different, really separates how we need to focus or what are, what are the work streams that you need to develop to be able to tackle this. In the case of usage, we need to be aware of our workload resizing. This is the mo most common intuitive one. When you think about improving your cost stance, you usually think, oh, I need to properly do a, a right resizing of, of my resources. That is how much I ask and how much I use. But there are also several other factors that are pretty important in driving your cost. Other one is uh, auto-scaling, having proper auto-scaling story, both on Kubernetes, like things like HPA and VPA, but also underlying. How, how much your cluster can be elastic to actually create new nodes or destroy nodes that you don't need anymore. And then another aspect that is highlighted there, because it's the aspect that we'll be actually touching during the rest of the talk, is cluster bin packing. Cluster bin packing means mean that you have a node, how well you're able to actually pack all the pods in this node to have the, the, le the least uh, slack resources in that node. And, and as you can see, uh, then there is a different aspect, like rate altogether, that is essentially uh, you need to understand what is the kind of discounts that you can get from your cloud provider on aspects like committing for certain amount of resources that you will be using over time, but also things like, for example, the CPU architecture that you're using. Is it Intel, AMD, ARM? Are your workloads ready to actually run on these, on these architectures? And then things like, for example, spot VMs. What in Richie, he did a really good approach to these spot VMs are kind of free chaos engineering because these are kind of uh, VMs that can disappear anytime. 
you have it there, they have a steep discount, but they can go without the notice, so maybe just a minute notice. So important then to, to focus here is how we separate this because also it impacts which teams will be in charge of each of these items that I'm highlighting there. So let's, let's try then to, to focus the rest of the talk, the talk on cluster bin packing. What we see there essentially is trying to, by the way, this is a graph in Grafana. As you can see, this is a result of, of some query there. What we see there over time is suspending. Like for example, if we focus at 5 p.m., during that hour from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m., we will be spending something like $1.4 in total. The top box is CPU, the bottom box is memory. And this also uh, is hinting us that we will narrow the rest of the talk to compute resources only, because in 25 minutes is, is what, you, what, what we can get. So um, again, this is a span, so this is dollar, time, dollar over time. If we apply the formula here, we see that actually this span is composed of discrete unit of resources. In this case, we are trying, for example, again at 5 p.m., we're trying to graph something like four nodes, for example. You have there the four nodes. Each node may have eight or 18 vCPU. Um, and then on the top, you have CPU, and on the bottom, memory. And you can see that the number is the same. But again, it's important to understand that it's not continuous what you request, especially when, you, when you're running a Kubernetes cluster on top of cloud. This will be discrete. Indeed, the nodes are being created or destroyed, as, as for example, to, to, to the right of the graph. This will be discrete amounts. And then a different dimension is how much are you paying for this, as we just saw. At the end of the day, what you will be paying for will be the volume that you're seeing there, essentially the integral, let's say the sum of each of these bars over time, over a period of time. Let's see then, uh, let's try to focus then, because this is kind of a pretty low level view, right? We are seeing there the nodes, we're trying to graph there, the nodes that we are driving from our cloud provider. Let's see, we need to understand then how Kubernetes workloads drive the creation of these units. And this is key to understand how we're going to cope on, on, with the cost on each of these aspects. Then let's see what drives Kubernetes costs. Here we try to graph uh, you know, a, a, a pod there. It's a, a just a simple web service that is asking for one CPU and two gig RAM. It's not your running. Uh, it's kind of pending until it can land into a node. There you have, it's asking one CPU, to with RAM, and it happened to land in a node that is 8 CPU and 16 gig of RAM. You can start to sense that there's something not so good regarding this picture until you actually put eight replicas and you have this kind of unicorn, awesome theoretical scenario where you, where you are right, we are exactly fulfilling the capacity of the node. Obviously, this is pretty theoretical, and indeed, Mark will address this uh, when we show the how we tackle this. We have uh, another poll there, and we have essentially the same scenario as before. Let that sink in. We have, essentially, if you, if you read through, the, through this graph, you will see that you have CPU at the node level, but CPU at the pod level also. Usually, when we use Kubernetes, we actually only see the up part, like, if you sum all the resources that, you are, that your pods are using, you will be seeing the, the aggregation of all these small boxes inside. But we need to be able to actually separate both, to measure both, to be able to, to, to see the driver and the effect of that. Driver being what is inside, and the effect is the actual nodes that's being allocated. So then we need to indeed Again, we are in this talk, we are just focusing on compute, so CPU and memory of nodes, and likewise for workloads. Uh, as Mark mentioned, uh, if you have cube state metrics, you will have these metrics provided by you. By the way, this is not meant to be a PromQL uh, class, of course, but just a quick introduction. What you have there, like cube node status capacity, is indeed the name of the metric. And this metric can have, as you can see, have several labels. These labels can have several values, the cardinality of this. And then the, the combination of the metric name 
and the label value will give you a single will give you a single point in time of data, and this is called time series. So just put, to put an example, you fix the cluster because you are taking care of you are actually watching this particular cluster. You fix resource to be equal CPU, for example. You fix the node because you are watching this node, and then you will get a number like eight, for example, for that metric about for that time series about eight because it has eight V CPU. Now we again this we are watching at the box that is hosting these pods. If we go to the pod level, you will see that we have a metric that is Q pod container resource request. So it will have we are we are not actually putting there the label like pod and and container just for the sake of of space in the screen. But essentially we essentially the same idea. You see that we have cluster resource node and namespace. And then Mark will help us uh, understand how we can bring some queries to aggregate this. Thank you, Juanjo. So, all right, again, bringing this all back is we're going to focus on the usage side because that's what drives your cost in your clusters. We have two metrics now that we could do some work with. And so let's step through. We're going to three examples of how to measure compute in your cluster. The first one is how do we measure the cost of our nodes? So in pseudocode and PromQL, um, we have this, again, we're expressing that formula, sum is equal to usage times rate. And to measure your nodes, you need to update your usage to get how much resources you've requested. So in this example, we have kube uh, node status capacity, and we're saying we want the resource uh, of CPU. And what's charted on the right is going to be how many CPUs for an entire cluster you have, um, what's called, how many CPUs are being requested to summed up. Um, as the graph goes down, that's kind of showing that there's fewer nodes. As that graph goes up, it means that there's more nodes. Um, and now that we know the number of cores of a cluster, we could then figure out what does it cost to run that cluster. We're going to cheat a little bit today. For rate, um, what we're going to do is we're going to go to a cloud provider, right? And there's three things that you really care about for cost of a CPU. It's the region that you're in, the instance type, and whether or not it's an on-demand machine or if it's a spot machine. So in this example, what we're going to do is we're going to find out, we're, we're going to use the on-demand price because it's most likely you're running an on-demand machine. Um, so we're going to take the three cents per, uh, per hour for vCPU, and we're going to plug that into rate. And charted, what that looks like is over time, how much we're spending per, per minute. And we're going to come back to a minute. And the, your cloud provider charges you per hour, but we're going to um, cast it to a minute because in this, this query, you can explore your data, right? This is something you could, whatever tool you're using, you could explore it, um, and you could chart it over time, but most likely if you have a lot of nodes, a lot of clusters, this query, you're probably not going to go further than a week, maybe a month if you're in a smaller cluster. So we cast it to a minute. And what we're going to do is we're going to create something called a recording rule in Prometheus. And if you haven't used uh, recording rules before, it's pretty much, it's a job that runs periodically. It's defined in YAML. And what you do is you specify the, the uh, metric name that you want to store this data into. You give it the expression. In this case, it's that the, the example we had sum by cluster. Um, and you attach to it a label. In this case, we're saying resources CPU. And so when this runs in uh, Prometheus, what's going to happen, every minute this runs, it's going to tick, it's going to calculate the cost per minute, and it's going to store it in uh, the record cluster cost per minute sum, and with a, a resource label of CPU. And this allows you, eventually you could do memory, you could do persistent volumes, you could do object storage. Realistically, resource could be um, many different factors. So, once you have this running, you, it stores it over time. So that's how you measure nodes. Most likely, your nodes isn't really, you know, you probably could get a sense of what you're spending. You probably really care about what is actually costing what. And in this case, we're showing a little bit more of a realistic example where we're running <laughs> pretty much the Prometheus community. And um, one of the things that we do, at least internally with Grafana, is we use uh, namespaces to isolate our workloads. So in this case, we have a Prometheus instance that running in likely high availability mode. It's bigger because it's most likely consuming a lot of memory. 
And then we have a bunch of other little workloads. So the question is, how do you measure this? Like, how do you measure that namespace? Because this is probably the most important aspect for your engineering teams. So coming back, we're going to alter that um, equation just a little bit. In this case, we're going to do sum by namespace. And instead of the usage, we're going to look at requests, right? What is the workloads running in that namespace requesting? So from kube state metrics, you have this metric, kube pod container resource requests. And again, we're doing CPU because that's most likely the most expensive. And if you look at the graph, one of the things you might notice again is that it's going up and down over time. So nodes, when you're measuring nodes, that's just going to be new nodes added, new nodes deleted, or uh, new <laughs> nodes deleted. In this case, it's most likely replicas. You, you likely are using some type of horizontal pod auto scaling policy. And so as the um, number of cores goes down, you likely have less replicas. As it goes up, you likely have more. Once the newer version of Kubernetes comes out and you could have dynamic resource requests, this is probably going to change a little bit. Um, so again, we're going to cheat here, and for rate, we're going to use that same three, about three cents um, per, per hour. We're going to convert it to a minute. And this is the cost per namespace charted over time. And, and this is a made-up example where we generated some fake data. We have namespace A and namespace B. And you know, we could look to see how much is the cost per minute over time. So similarly, this is useful. You could run this today, and you could get some actual data um, on the cost of your namespace, but if you want to go over time, it's most likely not going to work. So we're going to fall back on a recording rule. In this case, we're going to call it cluster underscore namespace, cost per minute sum. And for the expression, we're going to use uh, the, what we had before in our explore. And we're going to, again, add the resource uh, label of CPU. So again, if you want to do memory, instead of it being the resource CPU, you change that to memory, find the hourly price of memory, do a little bit of conversion because uh, bytes and gigabytes, they, they don't always match up. So this is two examples. We have one more that I think is really important that lines up with almost every keynote speak about energy efficiency. And so both those examples, almost all three examples are extremely unlikely to happen in, 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 um, in a production cluster. Most likely what you're going to have is you're going to have a lot of nodes over time and each of those nodes is going to have a different level of, uh, um, what's it called, um, workloads running on it. And what we really care about from a platform perspective is figuring out how much of that extra space on that node are we not using. And the reason for that is that's, I mean, that, that you're paying for that entire node, and if it's not being used, you're wasting money, right? And you're wasting energy. And... It's, yeah, it's something important for us to track. So how do you measure that? This one's probably the most complex, but you have to kind of follow me. Um, instead of caring about the usage or the number of requests for a node or workload, you care about, you want to know how much capacity is on that node minus how much your workloads are requesting, right? That's going to be what drives your idle usage. Um, that's what's left over. And then times by the rate, and that gives you how much you're spending on just idle resources. So it's, it's a lot if you're not familiar with PromQL, um, but let's step through it, right? You have, on the inside, you have a sum by node of the capacity of, of the node minus sum by node of the requests on that node. And again, we're looking at CPU, and what's charted here on the right is how much we're spending per minute on resources that are not being used by anything. So, and we convert it to 60 seconds, because again, you could do maybe a week of this, 30 days, six months is not gonna, not gonna cut it. So, take a pause. It's three PromQL queries that we've looked at. If you're not familiar, it could be quite a bit. Um, I would love to be able to spend more time and step through memory, persistent volumes. You're gonna just have to bear with me. Oh, got ahead of myself. Um, let's look at that in recording rule, because th this is pretty interesting with what we do. Um, we have cluster namespace, cost per minute, sum, and we have this query here, right? The same one we had before. Notice, though, in a query, we don't sum up by namespace anywhere. And there's a reason for that. Is 
idle resource isn't associated to a namespace, it's associated to a node. We add an extra label called namespace under double underscore idle, and we call that a virtual namespace. Pretty much what we do is we associate all of the data, all of the spend that we're not using anything on into a single namespace, and we could do some pretty cool stuff with that. So here's where we're at. We showed a couple of things here. Unfortunately, can't step through the entire process, but I do want to show you what we do internally in Grafana and the, the way that we measure this. So if you put this all together, right, you draw the rest of that owl, you have this pretty complex looking query where what we're, what we're, what we're graphing here is how much, what's the percentage of all of our spend that's being associated with idle resources. And this is important for many reasons, right? This is money that we're spending to our cloud provider that isn't being used at all. So we have targets and goals within our organization of what we want to do with that. And what's really cool about this is that every month or every week we get a report on how much we spend within our organization by team. And also, as a platform, we care about the idle resources. So you might notice that there is a point where it kind of shoots up, right? About mid-July, July 14th, we noticed that, and we were able to react. And we were able to get that cost under control so that we didn't have a surprise bill. And so this is six months. We track this. We could uh, do it over a year, 18 months. Um, and yeah, so with everything, right, this has been an iterative process. It's taken a while. Um, I've been doing this, you know, we've been doing this for about a year, just trying to get to the point where we're at. Um, the first main, like, shortcoming of this approach, at least with what we shared with you, is that it only, it, it only works for homogenous clusters. Most likely you're going to have clusters with many different node types. And in our case, we run across many cloud providers. So that's, that's a hard problem to solve. So what we first did that worked very well was we averaged how much our CPU cost across all of our cloud providers. And instead of using that like three cents an hour, we use that, that the average for a month and use that in all of our recording rules. We did that for about six months. Um, and then from there, we used open cost. We deployed that to all of our clusters, and instead of using that estimated number, we're able to join a query, and we're able to uh, get the actual cost of the node, and it takes into account the region, it takes into account if it's spot, the type of instance. Um, and <clears throat> the interesting thing for us is that when we converted from the estimated to the actual numbers, our estimated was about 90% correct, right? And again, that's across three cloud providers. If I heard that, I wouldn't believe it. That's, it was really, <laughs> I couldn't believe when I saw the numbers, but we wrote about this in our blog post and we adopted open cost. so go check that out if you don't believe that. Um, the other thing right now is this only takes into account compute resources. So we could do CPU, we could do memory, we could do persistent volume. Most likely, at least within Grafana, we use a lot of object storage, which has a very different type of compute. And we want to be able to associate to our teams and let them understand how much they're spending on that resource as well. So it's something that we've built internally, and we're not quite sure what we're going to do. But there will be something from that. Um, now, you might have noticed all of my examples. I used AWS for billing, you know, if you've used that before. But I pulled the numbers from GCP. Not all of your cloud providers are going to give you an actual breakdown of CPU and memory. So if you're in, if your cloud provider doesn't give that to you, it's about 80%. Uh, if, if they just give you the total cost of an instance, it's about 80% for CPU, 20% memory. So you could do some math on that to figure that one out. Um, and then finally, namespaces doesn't match up to teams. So from a platform perspective, this is really powerful for us to figure out at a resource. But our engineers, they, they need to know, like, not just the namespace, but how much are they spending. So we have this kind of like magical uh, little metric that is part of our CI process um, that associates the namespace to teams so that when we build these queries, after the recording rules, we're able to join up namespace to team, and we could then provide all of our teams a breakdown of their costs. Uh, With, yeah, just to, to, to add a bit on top of what Mark said, 
attribution here, right? Being able to attribute so that teams, actual engineering teams, can take care of the costs that they own. Uh, and imagine that underscore idle, to which team it goes, it goes to platform team. So interesting here also the defining the ownership, doing this, this uh, being able for teams to actually own their own costs so that they can actually do the, what is called TCO for, total cost of ownership for by the teams. Um, with this lesson learned, let, let's see what lessons we learned on the, our BIM packing journey. Uh, oops, maybe none, or maybe we need to ask ourselves first a question. Do we have a resource request for our workloads? Uh, resource, CPU, memory, yes, uh, ish, at least the more re relevant ones, few hands up, okay. You cannot embark in this uh, journey if you don't tackle this properly, because the resource that you request for your pods is what drives the scheduler to actually land those pods in, in a particular node that has that capacity available. And then the view that the scheduler has regarding the proper beam packing, the scheduler together with the cluster of the scaler, needs to know how much you are requesting for that pod. Again, we're talking about beam packing, not resizing, that is, we're not talking here in this talk about how well you are using the resources that you request. We are talking about how well we are been packing what you request for on the nodes that you have available. So here, essentially, the idea of this is to share, the, to share you some tools, some approaches that ha has helped us. In GKE, by default, the cluster run with something that is called balance mode. Balance mode, let's say, is trying to be gentle with the pods, trying to do a fair distribution of the pods over the nodes that you have available. If you switch that, and this is a cluster-wise setting, to optimize utilization, this is the opposite. It will try to actually do this beam packing. But again, if you don't have those requests defined, and instead of beam packing, you will have pods smashing, right? You need to be able to, to, uh, to tell the scheduler how much you're requesting for. Very useful for that, for, for, for us. Uh, I, will, I will give you some, some numbers in a bit. For the kind of patterns that, that, uh, that we have in Grafana, we have essentially continuous deployment, so we don't have a day where we deploy. We have so many teams working. Where, so essentially, we're const constantly deploying, rolling out new versions or, or, or new settings for, for the services that we run. And this creates a lot of fragmentation at the nose. So let's say that you have a point in time where you have an awesome beam packing uh, picture, like 20 something percent, as, uh, as Mark was showing. But then you do a roll up, and then it's essentially you fragment all this node with all these gaps of resources. So by allocating new nodes where the new posts are landing. And what we found in our, because of the way that we use the platform is that in GKE, at least, this was, this was taking too long. After all, a rollout, it may take two days to actually settle back to that idle percentage. Call out again, again to be able to measure that, because else you're running blind. All, all what, what just Mark showed, and this is a per minute measure. So we are actually tracking that idle, so we will able to react on, on that and say, okay, this is taking too long. A tool that helped us that is certainly not a silver bullet, and you need to understand how it works, it has many knobs, is that the scheduler. The scheduler will try indeed to observe how well you are using those nodes, has several strategies. One of them is high node utilization. And then it, if it observes that the node is being underutilized, it will evict the pods to be able to kill the node. But of course, you need to understand the scheduler. Uh, again, it's not a silver bullet, you, if we have some, in this, some <laughs> incidents because of this. We have to really tweak this properly. This is, this is on GKE. We are running on three main cloud providers. In AWS, uh, we replace the cluster, the autoscaler. A call out, an important call out here. In Google, the scheduler and the cluster autoscaler are in the corner plane. So you, in GKE, you don't control it. In AWS, there's this difference. The scheduler is in the control plane, but you need to run your own cluster to scaler. So this is replaceable. Carpenter is an open source project um, that actually uh, tends to replace the, the stock cluster to scaler. And it has so many knobs, things like you can configure, for example, the especially the diversity of the underlying nodes to, to better match the shape of the pods. By shape, I mean the ratio of memory divided by CPU 
match the shape of the paws with the shape of the nose and have a, a better beam packing story. And we are really lucky uh, today, like yes, today, we published a, a blog post by a couple of teammates that were actually working in Carpenter, Logan and Paula, which has, which has a pretty well detailed and some really interesting views on, again on this, on how Carpenter has help, helped us, especially on, the, on our beam packing story. And then finally, a call out for this uh, white paper by Google, Status Kubernetes Cost Optimization. And, uh, and with that, I think that we're done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And, and thanks. Oh. Sorry, fine. I, I forgot something. Numbers. I, I had promised some numbers. We went for something like, without touching anything on our cluster, we were hovering 40, 45% of idle resources. Consider that if you have 50% of idle resources, you are essentially paying for the double that you are actually using, right? Your, your nodes are using half. So we went for something like 45-ish to 22, 25% of idle usage. Next question. Questions? Question? Too late. Please use the microphone. Uh, <clears throat> I noticed you were using requests uh, for everything. Does that not uh, consider limits uh, by itself? Or is that the container request and then the limits are on top of that? So the main thing that the scheduler cares about is what you request, right? So if you have upper limits, like it could go up to that and that's fine. But the main thing that we care about is tracking what our resources are requesting. Um, we've, we've done some analysis comparing the two, right? Looking at the, the maximum value between either the, the limit, the usage that they've had versus the request. And at least in our organization, it really has been negligible. So we focus on requests, at least, yeah, to keep it simple. Right, so kind of follow up to that, like, shouldn't it be the max of usage or requests in order to get the correct number for the workload? Uh, so uh, as, as we mentioned, in this particular talk, we're actually focusing on beam packing, so understanding how the scheduler is able to beam pack the pods. We are not focusing on right sizing. That will be a, a completely different approach. You have different metrics to try to see how well you are using the amount of request, the, the, the request that you are requesting. So, but that's why uh, we wanted to highlight at the start of the talk when we talk about, uh, about um, usage, that is a different aspect of usage. This is how, how much of your, if I understand correctly, your question will be how well you are using how the resources that you are requested at the pod level. The other question is about CPU, like you broke down a node into CPU cost versus memory cost. I'm not sure if that's accurate, because like, let's say you reserve a node on AWS, right? It comes with four CPU and let's say 16 gigs of memory. You can't really break down that into like separate costs, because like you can reserve 16 gigs of memory, but you only use two CPU, but you're still taking up the whole node, right? So. Yeah, and that, that's a great question. So I. I the way that we, we approach this internally is we're not trying to get to accounting level accuracy to have it line up exactly with our bill. We're just trying to have a rough approximation of each workload, what it's requesting, what those units of cost are, and we sum that up over time. And for us, we're really looking for trends, right? We want to see over time for our workloads, what have they requested and um, calculate the cost of those requests. Gotcha. Thanks. Thank you. Great talk. Um, question, is there a place that you publish any dashboard that has this like different like, queries? Le so like open source or yeah, like open, internally? Yeah, open source. Obviously. Not yet. That's not the we're trying to figure out. So we, we use um, like JSON internally to publish a lot of our dashboards, a lot of our queries and whatnot. So it's one of those things where we're trying to figure out the right balance because most people probably aren't using JSON it. Um, but if it's something that you're interested in, um, you can join our Slack channel and we're, we will more than happy to share that. Right, cool. Yeah, we actually run short of time. We, we wanted to create a repo with, uh, let's say, already manifested uh, because uh, as Mark mentioned, we're using JSON it. Sometimes the, the 
Jason, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to, to get started with. So, oh. Yeah, just a little. So we wanted, let's say, to, to, to share the already manifested uh, recording rules. But we ran out of time. And that's why we created this resource, uh, essentially a channel there in our Slack. And um, we may actually publish in, uh, some of these as, as excerpts, but yeah, it's, it's in our plans to actually publish the, the full. Yeah, I will sure. reach out through Slack. Uh, yeah, sure. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Probably have time for one more question. Anybody? With that, thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. <laughs>